Dear aspirants, Shankar IAS Academy is conducting All India Online Free Mock Test on 20th September 2020 and 27th September 2020. The link for registration is given in the description section as well as in the comment section. We request the aspirants to make use of this opportunity for the upcoming prelims 2020. Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy. The list of news articles along with the page numbers of 5 different editions is given here for your reference. Let us now begin our analysis. This news article talks about the preventive detention. The news is that the Madhya Pradesh High Court has quashed an order invoking provisions of the National Security Act. So in this context, let us discuss what do we mean by preventive detention and the relevant constitutional provisions. The relevant syllabus is given here for your reference. First, what is preventive detention? Before looking into it, know that generally a person is detained in two circumstances. One is punitive and the second one is preventive. Punitive detention is to punish a person for an offence that has been committed by that person after trial and conviction in a court. That is punishing for a wrongdoing. Whereas, if you look at preventive detention, it means detention of a person without a trial and conviction by a court. The purpose is not to punish a person for a past offence, but to prevent that person from committing an offence in the near future. So, preventive detention is only a precautionary measure and it is based on suspicion. Now, what are the constitutional provisions that provide for preventive detention? We have Article 22 in our Indian Constitution that provides for two types of detention, punitive and preventive, the definition of which we just saw. The first part of this Article 22 deals with the cases of ordinary law and the second part deals with the cases of preventive detention law. So, the second part of this Article 22 grants protection to persons who are arrested or detained under a preventive detention law. And this protection is available to both citizens as well as aliens. The protection includes the detention of a person cannot exceed three months unless an advisory board reports sufficient cause for extended detention. This advisory board is to consist of judges of a high court. The grounds of detention should be communicated to the detainee, but the facts considered to be against the public interest need not be disclosed. And next, the detainee should be afforded an opportunity to make a representation against the detention order. So, these are the protection that is available to both the citizens as well as aliens in the second part of Article 22. And if you look at this Article 22, it also empowers the parliament to make a law to decide under what circumstances a person can be detained and the maximum period for such detention and also the details and the procedure to be followed by the advisory board. So, all these would be as per the legislation that has been enacted by the parliament. So, based on these constitutional provisions, many preventive detention laws were made by the parliament. Interestingly, if you see, the preventive detention laws are not new in India. If you had been reading your static portion of modern Indian history, you might have come across the fact that the existence of preventive detention laws date back to the early days of the colonial era, when the Bengal Regulation No. 3 of 1818 was enacted. This regulation empowered the then East India government to arrest anyone for defence or maintenance of public order without giving the person an opportunity to approach the court against the detention. Then a century later, the British government enacted the Rowlett Acts of 1919 that allowed confinement of a suspect without trial. For this act, Mahatma Gandhi organised Rowlett Satyagraha and it was also a major reason for starting the non-cooperation movement. Now, it is very unfortunate that the provisions against we fought during freedom struggle are still existing in independent India, though in a mild or less severe form, but it still exists. So, what was the situation after independence? After independence, the first preventive detention rule was made during the Prime Ministership of Jawaharlal Nehru by enacting the Preventive Detention Act of 1950. After this act expired in 1969, the then Prime Minister Ms. Indira Gandhi brought in the controversial Maintenance of Internal Security Act in the year 1971. This was famously called as MISA. This act was very controversial since it was used draconianly to suppress the anti-government voices during the emergency period and many leaders were detained under this MISA. Immediately after the new government came to power in 1977, this act was repealed. However, when Ms. Indira Gandhi came back to power again in the year 1980, she brought one more law in the form of National Security Act of 1980. And this is the act which is still in force that we are discussing now. So, what is this National Security Act of 1980? This act simply empowers the central government or a state government 
to detain a person in order to prevent that person from acting in any manner that is prejudicial to national security. The government can also detain a person to prevent that person from disrupting the public order or for maintenance of supplies and services essential to the community. The maximum period for which a person may be detained is 12 months, that is 3 months at a time. But if you look, this term of 12 months can be extended if the government finds fresh evidence. Here, it should also be noted that whenever an officer orders for preventive detention, then that officer should report the order to the concerned state government and the state government should approve such order in 12 days. If not approved within 12 days, then this preventive detention order becomes invalid. When the state government approves the preventive detention order, then it should report the order to the central government within 7 days. And when a person is detained under this National Security Act, then that person should be communicated the grounds of detention within 5 days and in exceptional circumstances within 15 days. However, if there are certain grounds that are considered to be against the public interest, then such grounds need not be disclosed to the person who is detained under this act. So, these are some of the basic provisions of this National Security Act of 1980. This act has become much controversial in the recent days as many times this act was invoked in cases of cow slaughter, maharam processions, etc. And the NSA cases are not available in the National Crime Records Bureau since the FIRs are not filed in NSA cases. So, the exact number of preventive detentions are not known to the common public. So, there is much criticism and public demand to repeal this National Security Act. However, to protect the interests of the country in the time of high radicalism and extreme hostilities with neighbors, the preventive detention laws are obviously required. But it is the government of the day that should ensure that such laws are used only for genuine reasons. So, this is in brief about the discussion of this news article. In this news article, we saw about the two types of detention, the constitutional provisions that are available for detention and then we saw the history of preventive detention since the arrival of the colonial powers and then we saw about the National Security Act of 1980. Now have a look at this practice question. Let us move on to the next news article. This discussion is based on these news articles that speaks about the three agricultural bills that were recently passed by Lok Sabha. These bills have led to the protests by the farmer producer organizations and by various sections of farming society across many states. So, in this discussion, let us see the pros and cons of these three bills from Maine's perspective. The relevant syllabus is given here for your reference. The three bills that have been recently passed by the Lok Sabha are Farmers Produce Trade and Commerce Promotion and Facilitation Bill of 2020, then Farmers Empowerment and Protection Agreement Price Assurance and Farm Services Bill of 2020, and Bill number 3, the Essential Commodities Amendment Bill of 2020. First, let us discuss the advantages and disadvantages offered by these bills. The first bill, Farmers Produce Trade and Commerce Promotion and Facilitation Bill of 2020, is expected to create one India, one agriculture market, wherein it will create an ecosystem where the farmers and traders will enjoy freedom of choice of sale and purchase of agri-produce. It will promote barrier-free interstate and intrastate trade and commerce outside the physical premises of markets that are notified under the state agricultural produce marketing legislations. It opens more choices for farmer and reduces the marketing costs. It will help the farmers of regions with surplus produce to get better prices and consumers of regions with shortages will get the produce in lower prices. And then if you see, it also permits the electronic trading of scheduled farmers' produce in the specified trade area. More importantly, this bill prohibits the state governments from levying any market fee or cess or levy on farmers, traders and electronic trading platforms for trade of scheduled farmers' produce in a trade area, that is outside the government regulated trade area, because as per the bill, the definition of trade area does not include the trading areas under the state APMCs. Now, this bill is strongly opposed because the APMCs form the backbone of the existing trading agreements and this bill liberalizes the agricultural marketing. But if you see, some states have already liberalized their state APMC acts through amendments. So, what they oppose is the unrestricted commerce in trade areas outside the APMC jurisdictions without levy of any fee because it is a source of revenue for the state governments. 
As of now, the state governments are free to impose the mandi fees and other charges in both APMC mandis and other areas outside them. But now, a portion of revenue will be lost by passing this bill. And also, if you see, this bill empowers the central government to issue orders to the states for carrying out the provisions of the bill. So, all this has agitated the state governments. Further, all the measures under this bill, in a way, end the monopoly of the APMCs located across various states. And this is viewed by the critics as a sign of ending the assured procurement of food grains at minimum support prices. The states are so opposed to the bills that already the Rajasthan government countered this bill with an administrative order negating some of its effects. Like the order has declared all the warehouses under FCI, Central Warehousing Corporation and Rajasthan State Warehousing Corporation that are meant for procurement on MSP as procurement centers under the State APMC Act. So at these centers, the Monday fee will be charged. The second bill, which is the Farmers Empowerment and Protection Agreement Price Assurance and Farm Services Bill of 2020 is regarding contract farming. It provides for a farming agreement between the farmer and buyer prior to the production or rearing of any farm produce. Here the advantage is that it provides for minimum and maximum period of an agreement. The minimum period will be one crop season or one production cycle in case of livestock. And the maximum period is five years unless the production cycle is more than five years. And more importantly, the agreement should contain the details such as the price of farming produce, a guaranteed price for the produce in cases where the prices are subjected to variations, then about the process of price determination, and then about the conciliation board as well as a conciliation process for dispute settlement. So all these would protect and empower the farmers against price exploitation. Now the disadvantage of this bill is that it does not prescribe the mechanism for price fixation. And the critics are also concerned about the formal contractual obligations as the farm sector is of unorganized nature. Also there is lack of resources for farmers for a legal battle with the private corporate entities if these entities breach the agreement. Now coming to the third bill which is the Essential Commodities Amendment Bill. This bill amends the Essential Commodities Act of 1955. It allows the central government to regulate the supply of certain food items only under extraordinary circumstances such as war, famine, extraordinary price rise and natural calamity of grave nature. And the food items that will be regulated under this amendment bill include cereals, pulses, potato, onions, edible oil seeds and oils. Further, if you see, the stock limits may be imposed on agricultural produce only if there is a steep price rise, such as if there is a 100% increase in the retail price of horticultural produce. Now, the fear is that this essential commodities amendment bill ultimately benefits the middlemen and the traders because now the private players will buy the produce in the harvest season when the prices are generally lower and they will stockpile it and they are bound to release it later when the prices are high in the market. So at the end, the small and the marginal farmers will not get the benefits. So these are some of the pros and cons of these three farming bills that you need to know from exam perspective. Now if you look at this news article, the Prime Minister has defended the passing of these three bills in Lok Sabha. He tells that misinformation is being spread across India, that farmers will not be getting right prices of their produce. But here, the point which the Prime Minister tries to emphasize is that farmers can now sell their produce anywhere in the country without any restrictions such as the APMC setups. And the Prime Minister has also said that the farmers of India will now have freedom from the middlemen since they will get more options and opportunities to sell their produce. So it has become some sort of protection safety for the farmers. So he has requested the farmers to not to believe those persons who are spreading misinformation. And he has also said that the government is committed to giving the right minimum support price to farmers. Meanwhile, if you see, in opposition to these three farmers' bills, the Union Minister of Food Processing Industry resigned from the Union Cabinet. And we discussed about this particular news in our yesterday's news analysis, wherein we discussed about collective responsibility. And as we saw during our discussion, farmers across India are protesting against the passing of these three bills. This news article tells that over 250 farmer and farm workers organizations who come under the umbrella of All India Kisan Sankarsh Coordination Committee have called for a Bharat Band on 25th September in protest against the passing of these three farmers' bills. 
Their concern is that these three bills will completely stop the government procurement of crops, thereby ending the price security that is available for the farmers. Why? Because the private mandis will be set up and as we saw the trade regulation of all the cereals, pulses, oil seeds, onion and potato will be removed from coverage under essential commodities. So some 250 farmer and farm worker organizations have planned to hold a Bharat Band on 25th September. And not just this, two hotspot states are also against the passing of these three bills which are Punjab and Haryana. It has caused quite an agitation in both these states, even at the political level, where the political leaders of the ruling party and the opposition parties are accusing each other. This is in brief about the discussion of all these news articles, which is related to the passing of three farmers related bills in Lok Sabha. So try to know about the pros and cons of these three bills from Maine's perspective. Now have a look at this practice question. Let us move on to the next news article. This news article is about the Customs Administration of Rules of Origin under Trade Agreements Rules 2020, in short called as CAROTA 2020, which is to come into effect from 21st September 2020. So in this context, let us discuss some of the salient features of this rules. The relevant syllabus is given here for your reference. First of all, you need to know about the concept of country of origin or rules of origin. See, it is the criteria that is needed to determine the national source of a particular product. That is, from which country a particular product comes from. Its importance is derived from the fact that the duties and certain restrictions in certain cases depend upon the source of imports. See, in the budget speech this year, the finance minister committed to protect the domestic industry from misuse of free trade agreements. So, Carotar was framed under the Customs Act of 1962. It was notified on 21st August 2020 after a 30-day period that was given to the importers and other stakeholders to familiarize themselves with the new provisions. These rules will come into force on 21st September. The rules shall apply to import of goods into India where the importer makes claim of preferential rate of duty in terms of the trade agreement. Here preferential rate of duty means rate at which the customs duty is charged in accordance with a trade agreement. Under the rules an importer is now required to do due diligence before importing the goods in order to ensure that they meet the prescribed originating criteria. A list of minimum information which the importer is required to possess has also been provided in the rules along with the general guidance. Also, an importer would now have to enter certain origin related information in the bill of entry as available in the certificate of origin. Note that the new rules will support the importer to correctly ascertain the country of origin and properly claim the concessional duty. It will assist the customs authorities in smooth clearance of legitimate imports under the free trade agreements. Hence, the Central Board of Indirect Taxes and Customs has been actively engaging with the stakeholders through webinars and other means to guide them on the compliance with the new rules and to clarify any doubts that they may have. Not just that, when implemented, these character rules will prevent the domestic industry from the misuse of free trade agreements and undue competition. Now let us make it simple, as we know India has signed free trade agreements with several countries as you can see here. This includes countries like Japan, South Korea and all the Asian members. Under such agreements, two trading partners significantly reduce or eliminate the import duties or the customs duties on maximum number of goods that are traded between them. So from 21st September, the importers will have to ensure that the imported goods meet the prescribed rules of origin provisions in order to avail the benefits under the free trade agreements. So the benefit of concessional customs duty rate applies only if an FTA member country is the country of origin of a particular good. To make it more understanding, goods originating from China and that are routed through the Asian countries will no more be eligible for customs duty concessions under the Asian free trade agreement. So what if it is determined that the goods originating from an exporter do not meet the prescribed origin criteria? Then the principal commissioner of customs or the commissioner of customs may without any verification reject all the other claims of preferential rate of duty for identical goods that are imported from the same exporter. Then the importer shall be informed of the reasons of rejection in writing. Assume that the exporter or the producer modifies the manufacturing or other origin related conditions 
so as to fulfill the origin requirement of the rules of origin. Then the authorities can restore the preferential tariff treatment on identical goods with prospective effect. So let us hope that the new rules would strengthen the customs in checking any attempted misuse of the duty concessions under the free trade agreement. In a way it will also prevent dumping of that originate from certain countries like China. This is all about the discussion of this news article. Now have a look at this practice question. Let us move on to the next news article. This news article is about India's foreign exchange reserves. This particular topic comes under India's external sector in your economy syllabus. This news article tells that India's foreign exchange reserves declined by $353 million to reach $541.66 billion. This fall in the foreign exchange reserves, also called forex reserves, was due to a decline in the foreign currency assets. In this context, let us discuss in detail about India's forex reserves. See, foreign exchange reserves are an important component of the balance of payment, an essential element in the analysis of an economy's external position. Know that India's foreign exchange reserves comprise the following foreign currency assets, gold reserves, special drawing rights, and reserve tranche position in the International Monetary Fund. Among them, foreign currency assets constitute the largest portion. Know that they are maintained as a multi-currency portfolio that comprises of major currencies such as US dollars, euros, then the pound sterling, then Japanese yen, etc. And these currencies are valued in terms of US dollars. Next, coming to special drawing rights, they are an artificial currency instrument created by the International Monetary Fund in the year 1969. IMF uses them for internal accounting purposes. The value of SDR is calculated from a weighted basket of major currencies such as US dollar, Euro, Japanese yen, Chinese renminbi and British pound. The SDR interest rate is the interest rate that is paid to the members for their remunerated creditor positions in the IMF and India is a member of IMF. It also provides the basis for calculating the interest rate that is charged from the member countries when they borrow from the IMF. Next is the reserve transposition. Note that IMF is funded through its members and their quota contributions. The reserve tranche is basically an emergency account that IMF members can access at any time without agreeing to conditions of paying a service fee. That is, it is that portion of a member country's quota which can be withdrawn free of charge at its own discretion. If you look at the quota, US as the largest quota roughly around 17.5% and India as a quota of somewhere around 2.6%. Now coming to the final component which is the gold reserve. See the gold reserves are maintained by the Reserve Bank of India. The value of gold reserves is expressed either in US dollars or in Indian rupee. At present India is the 10th largest country in the world in terms of gold reserves and USA as the world's largest gold reserves. So this is in brief about foreign exchange reserves. In case of India, the reserve accumulation has been due to the managed exchange rate through RBA intervention then current account deficit and a surplus account on the balance of payments on account of inflows on capital account and also foreign currency assets. Now coming to the advantages, the foreign exchange provides import cover. Know that your import cover measures the number of months of imports that can be covered with the help of foreign exchange reserves that is available with the central bank of any country. In our country, it is RBI. Roughly if you see 8 to 10 months of import cover is essential for the stability of the currency of any particular country. So this is in brief about the discussion of forex reserves. Now have a look at this practice question. Let us move on to the next news article. This news article mentions about the inquiry conducted on Shopian encounter that happened in July in the Kashmir Valley. Based on the inquiry, the Indian Army has concluded that the powers vested under the APSPA, that is the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, were exceeded during the operation. Further, the do's and don'ts of the Chief of Army Staff as approved by the Supreme Court have also been contravened or breached. So, in this context, you need to know about APSPA from exam perspective. First, know that there are two APSPAs which are in operation. One is exclusively for Jammu and Kashmir, which is known as Armed Forces Jammu and Kashmir Special Powers Act of 1990. And the other act is applicable to some of the northeastern states of India, which is called APSPA 1958. Today's news talks about the Jammu and Kashmir APSPA only. Know that 
the jammu and kashmir reorganization act of 2019 is silent about whether this particular act is in force or repealed in jammu and kashmir this means that the act is not yet repealed since there was no mention about this act in the jammu and kashmir reorganization act now coming to this act it was enacted to enable certain special powers to be conferred upon the members of the armed forces in the disturbed areas in jammu and kashmir for this purpose the central government can declare an area as disturbed area by notification in the official gazette and the act also provides the same powers to the governor of the erstwhile state of jammu and kashmir so maybe now the powers will be exercised by the lieutenant governors of the two newly formed union territories now any area can be declared as disturbed area if the central government or the lieutenant governor is of the opinion that a particular area even the whole of the union territory is in such a disturbed and dangerous condition that the use of armed forces in aid of the civil power is necessary to prevent these activities such as the activities involving terrorist acts and those activities that are directed towards disclaiming questioning or disrupting the sovereignty and territorial integrity of india so the section 4 of this act provides these special powers to the armed forces moreover if you see this act protects the armed forces because there is no prosecution suit or other legal proceeding that shall be instituted on armed forces for anything done in exercise of powers under the act except with the previous sanction of the central government so this is in brief about the afspa jammu and kashmir act of 1990 so remember there are two afspas one for jammu and kashmir and the other act for the rest of india now have a look at this practice question let us move on to the next news article now let us look at this editorial this editorial is about the afghan peace process In this editorial the author has described about the US led Afghan peace process in this context you need to know about the background of this Afghan peace deal that was signed between US and the Taliban forces and the major provisions of this US Taliban peace deal we have discussed in detail about all these aspects in our 31st August 2020 analysis now if you look here one of the important provisions of this US Taliban peace deal is to initiate intra afghan peace negotiations as a part of this on 12th september the intra afghan peace talks happened between taliban and the afghan high council for national reconciliation at doha in qatar throughout this afghan peace process india did not take part in it but in this 12th september intra afghan talks india took part The external affairs minister of India addressed the opening session of this Doha meeting where he stressed the fact that the Afghan peace process must be Afghan led, Afghan owned and Afghan controlled. The main concern of India with regards to Pakistan is that anti India activities of the terrorist groups should not happen in Afghanistan. So the author tells that if India wishes this then it must engage directly with the Taliban. Here the author has shared an interesting fact about the reality of this particular Afghan peace deal. He tells that the reality is the major powers have only limited interests in Afghanistan. No major power is taking ownership for the reconciliation talks, but they are just acting as facilitators. So the author suggests that India should actively engage with Afghanistan and work with like-minded forces in the region in order to ensure the vacuum that will be created by the withdrawal of US forces in order to ensure that violence does not creep back again in Afghanistan so this is all that you need to know from this editorial try to know the background of the issue between US and Taliban and the recently signed US Taliban peace deal now let us move on to the next news article This news article discusses about the attempts made by Belarus and its allies at the UN Human Rights Council meeting to block the video message of the opposition leader of Belarus. See Belarus is facing a huge crackdown on protests over the disputed re-election of its president Alexander Lukashenko. If you like to know more about this Belarus episode, we request you to watch our 12th August the Hindu news analysis. where we discussed about this ongoing issue in addition we also discussed about the geography and polity of belarus if you see the opposition leader of belarus actively took part in the protests but later she took shelter in lithuania and has sent her video message to the united nations human rights council where she has urged that a strong international response to the abuses happening in belarus is required in this context you need to know about united nations 
Human Rights Council from Prelims perspective. We request you to have a look at our 21st June Hindu News Analysis to know in detail about this Human Rights Council. Now let us move on to the practice questions discussion session. This question is about preventive detention. It is a two statement question and you need to choose the correct statement or statements. Look at the first statement. It tells that the protection offered under constitution to the persons detained under preventive detention laws is applicable only to Indian citizens. This statement is incorrect. As per article 22, it is applicable to Indian citizens as well as aliens. Now look at the second statement. It tells that the cases registered under National Safety Act of 1980 are not included in the crime data collected by the National Crime Records Bureau. Yes, this statement is correct as we saw during our discussion. So the correct answer here is option B, two only. This question is about Customs Administration of Rules of Origin under Trade Agreements Rules of 2020. Three statements are given and it asks which of these three are the benefits offered under these 2020 rules. Assist customs authorities in smooth clearance of legitimate imports under free trade agreements. Help importer to correctly ascertain the country of origin and properly claim the concessional duty. Protection to domestic industry from misuse of free trade agreements. Here all three are the advantages of this customs rules of 2020. Hence the correct answer is option D, 1, 2 and 3. This question is about India's forex reserves. It asks which of the above are part of India's foreign exchange reserves foreign currency assets, special drawing rights, reserve transposition, gold reserves. All these four are part of India's foreign exchange reserves. So the correct answer is option D, all of the above. This question is about Armed Forces Jammu and Kashmir Special Powers Act of 1990. It is a two statement question and you need to choose those statement or statements that are incorrect. Look at the first statement. It tells that armed forces is empowered to fire upon or use force even to the causing of death against any person who is acting in contravention of any law or order for the time being in force in the disturbed area. And statement two tells that armed forces can arrest any person without warrant against whom reasonable suspicion exists that he has committed or is about to commit a cognizable offence. Here both the statements are correct, hence the correct answer here is option D, neither 1 nor 2, since you need to choose those statements or statements that are incorrect. Now look at this question, E Shakti, sometimes seen in news, is an initiative of which of the following? Here the correct answer is option A, National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development, in short NABAR. Here the news is that the Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu wants all districts to be a part of NABAR's E Shakti platform. So what is this E Shakti platform? See, it is basically an initiative to digitize the self-help groups across India. So within one click, the social and financial information of all the members of the self-help groups will be available through this eShakti software program. These are some of the aims and benefits. One of the main benefit is that it will ease the transfer of social benefits and direct benefit transfer through other linked accounts. So it will basically make all the self-help group accounts financially inclusive. So the correct answer is option A, NABAD. Now look at this question, which one of the following is the aim of Vibe of Summit recently seen in news? Option A tells that it is an initiative of Ministry of Education with series of webinars on national education policy of 2020 and its implementation. This is incorrect. This option A is Sikshak Parv initiative. Now look at option B. It is a collaborative initiative by the Science and Technology and Academic Organizations of India to enable deliberations on thought process, practices and R&D culture with a problem solving approach for well defined objectives. Yes, this statement is correct. This initiative is basically what Vibe of Summit is about. This news article tells that the Vibe of Summit, also called the Vaishvik Bharatiya Vaigyanik Summit, will be inaugurated by the Prime Minister on 2nd of October. And these are the key areas of discussion in this summit. The main aim is to collaborate and cooperate with the academia and scientists in India. So the academic luminaries with Indian roots will take part in this summit. This summit will basically strengthen the Atmanirbhar Bharat initiative, that is the self-reliant India initiative for high-end research in science and technology. So the correct answer here is option B. Now have a look at this practice question. It is a 15 marks question. Answer this question in 250 words. 
critically evaluate the pros and cons of the recent bills that aim to bring far reaching reforms in agriculture. Post your answers in the comment section. We will review and give suitable suggestions and feedbacks within a reasonable time frame. With this we come to the end of the analysis of all the news articles taken up for today's discussion and also the practice questions discussion session. If you like the video press the like button comment and share and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for latest videos and updates. Stay focused and motivated friends. Thank you. Thank you.